Ever since Kerbal Space Program 2 came out, a lot of people, including myself, have been wondering what's up with the Monarches, specifically this Monarch in KSP-1. There was a very recent update just before KSP-2 came out that added this weird sort of solar system map buried beneath the rock that has been exposed after some sort of breakage event. Naturally, of course, I built a base on top of the Monarch, but yeah, the Mun is in KSP-2, obviously. Is this Monarch in the Kerbal Space Probe 2? Well, if you've seen the title and thumbnail, you'll know the answer is yes. So we're going to go check it out in today's video, see how it's different and see what's up. And uh, all of this is very much against the will of the Kraken. If you guys saw my uh, launch event live stream that I did for when Kerbal Space Probe 2 came out, and there were lots of, you know, weird bugs like the KSC was in orbit, things like that. This video, there's going to be... There were so many bugs and Kraken attacks, it was a real... I didn't know if I would actually be able to use any of this footage uh, in a video. Luckily, you are now watching a video, so obviously I managed to get it to work, but yeah. Ooh, it was rough, let me tell you. Here you can see me building my amazing Monlander. So far, most of the missions I've done have been fairly safe, right? Because I want to say most missions, I mean the videos that you've seen me make of KSP2 so far. Uh, the first three videos I did were filmed in a very short amount of time, a limited amount of time. I had to make vehicles that I just knew would work because I knew I wouldn't have a second opportunity if I needed to do any redesigns. Uh, and then my latest video was, um, not my latest video, but Friday I did a live stream where I kind of wanted to make sure the vessels worked in the live stream. Saturday we did a space shuttle, which, you know, is uh, fairly basic. I just wanted to build a space shuttle, basically. Uh, and now, now we've kind of done the basic stuff. Let's try and build a vehicle that's entirely KSP2, right? It's got the new parts, it's got the big new lander module and the uh, the big new cockpit at the top. We've got the big new landing legs and some... Uh, uh, those solar panels aren't new actually, but they were fairly new to KSP-1. They were fairly late on in KSP-1's life, those those panels were added. And of course, in true KSP-2 style, it's a lot of, lot of bugs. A lot of bugs plagued this craft. Uh, so yeah, all in all, a very Kerbal Space Program 2 vehicle. I hope you like it. I really liked how it came out. It came out really sort of... Uh, like industrial size, like sci-fi industrial look. I don't know what that aesthetic's called, but like a Hellgan ship. Any fans of, uh, any enjoyers of Killzone in the comments there? <laughs> and as you can see, I'm encapsulating it in the Starship style cargo bay pieces. So, uh, yeah, you know I'm gonna have to paint those bare stainless steel in just a second. I didn't choose to, uh, make this into a Starship. First of all, it's far too tall for it to be a correctly scaled Starship, and also... KSP2's performance and just the glitches and stuff, I just don't have it in me to try and do a Starship recreation yet. I think if I was going to do Starship, that would just be its own video, not just as some secondary thing to a MUN mission. Because it will take a long time, I imagine, to get it to work properly. But, you know, we've got the aesthetics down anyway. This is a, it's a replica of SN26. Ship 26, I should say. I don't know why I said SN26. That's a bit of a blast to the past, wasn't it? Uh, okay, and then the rest of the rocket's just your fairly basic big stack, really. A Rhino engine, and we've got some big XL fuel tanks at the bottom. Uh, and we're going to stick some big engines at the bottom as well. I was hoping I'd cut, that, that would sync up quite well for when I added the engines in the gameplay, but I guess not. There you go, there's the engine plate. Oh, actually, I must uh, offer some thanks. Uh, a lot of you told me that where the thrust to weight ratio indicator is in KSP2. There it is, there's the engineer's report. So I was just playing around with the engine count, see if I can get a good TWR that wasn't too powerful, but also, you know, powerful enough to get off the launch pad. In the end, I settled for three radially mounted, but then off offset mammoth engine. Now the TWR indicator isn't perfect, it doesn't tell you the TWR of any other stage except the first one, but hey, better than nothing, and I guess the first stage TWR is the most important value. Um, they're all important, but whatever. Here we are, launching! Oh, yep, yeah, uh, wobbly rockets. Um, Bit of a disappointment that they're back in KSP2. Yeah, this rocket was very, very noodly. I'm just going to play a little montage now of some failed flights. That top Starship style stage just kept on oscillating back and forth. I, In between each of these flights, I went back to the VAB and added loads and loads and loads of struts. I tried piloting it from different control points. You might you might see the, uh, the tail fins are getting bigger and bigger with each successive launch as well. But it just... 
It's just not fun, and I don't understand how the developers expect us to launch those giant interstellar ships and space stations seen in the trailers if we still have noodle rockets. It is probably my biggest gripe with KSP2 right now. It was the one thing I was really hoping would be gone in KSP2 was the wobbliness of the rockets, but sadly it is not the case. I know you can change the joint rigidity in the game files, but we shouldn't have to do that and I don't want to do that because I want my videos to be of KSP2, not KSP2 with modified code. Anyway, that was our uh, final launch. Apologies for the kind of negativity just there, but I felt I just had to get off my chest and you're about to see that uh, this rocket, although I had this got to space, very wobbly. You know, and I am playing the footage back quickly to kind of compensate for the, uh, the less than great performance of KSP2. But I think actually having the footage sped up like this helps you to kind of see the wobble a bit more easily and like be frantically using SAS and the gimbal of the engines and the control surfaces of the tail fins to try and keep the thing on course. And I just about managed to get it to get to space okay. Far too much Delta V, mind. Uh, I did consider maybe going back to the vehicle assembly building, reducing the amount of fuel to make it look like I'd, uh, you know, I wasn't just using a massively overkill booster. But I thought, you know what? I can't be bothered. It was so difficult to fly. I'm just gonna, you know, at the end of the day, this is kind of like a, a test of uh, of Ship 26, right? It's a test of the Starship. We're gonna test the re-entry because it's got a probe core that upper stage. So once we deploy our payload, we can close those cargo bay doors and deorbit will then crash. It's got no way of landing itself. I suppose it's got an engine, but I, I'm, I'm not going to try and recover it. But uh, problems arose, let me tell you. But we'll cover that when we get there. Going to speed the footage back even faster now because this part of the mission is quite boring. It's just me trying to raise my periapsis and keeping my apoapsis at a reasonably high height uh, until we get to our circularization burn. Gosh, the, uh, the, the engine plumes of the game do look good, don't they? And it definitely has its moments. There are a lot of ways in which KSP2 looks worse than modded KSP1, but there are some places in which it does look leagues better. And sometimes you just get little shots like this one where it's like, yeah, that looks pretty nice. That looks pretty nice. Okay, so wait, oh, <laughs> a bit of a, yeah, the paused, unpaused bug, unfortunately, is going to be quite prevalent throughout this video. Apologies for that in advance. Yeah, we've got an apoapsis of about 100 kilometers, and uh, we're going to periapsis is not too far off, 55, well, 54 now. Uh, yeah, th throughout this mission again, I had this weird bug where the SAS would just stop working. Either the ship would just start spinning randomly, or it would just not respond to any input at all. And I, it wasn't because I changed uh, my controls to docking mode, like JKL and I didn't do anything, pressing delete didn't do anything. Just a bug. The only way I could fix it was pressing F5, then F9. You know, reloading, saving, and then reloading that save. Anyway, uh, all that's to come. All the fun and excitement to come in this video, and so many more Kraken attacks. Oh my goodness. Uh, but first of all, we can see the mother spaceship giving birth to an off to a, to a young one. There we are. Our, mu our Munlander is born. There we are. What a shot. But with the deployment of the Munlander, we can go ahead and start thinking about switching back to the uh, the second stage of the in initial rocket. And we're going to do that. I'll deploy the solar panels first. Here we are. So I wanted to close the uh, cargo bay door at the top and then perform a deorbit burn so we can crash harmlessly into the ocean and not leave debris stuck in space. But as you can see, it says I had no comnet connection, which I think is a bit harsh, right? I'm literally in low carbon orbit. So can my probe not connect to the Kerbal Space Center from here? I guess not. Either it's a bug or you do, in fact, need to have communications antennas even in places like low carbon orbit. So there you are. Little pro tip. Either it was a bug or, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> you do need a communication station. Here's an example of the ship just randomly spinning and not responding to SAS inputs, by the way. Uh, I had to, like do that trick where you just initiate some non-physics time warp and then drop out of it and that locks the ship in place and then it started working again. Then it came to setting up a maneuver plan and uh, yeah then I forgot that there's still that bug where you can't see your orbital line passing a celestial body that's not in the sphere of influence you're currently in, i.e. I can't see the path I'll be taking past the moon, which is really not ideal at all because as you can see I don't have that much delta V. It seems like I've got a lot 
but this is a very, very heavy craft. So I'm going to need pretty much all of the Delta V. I've not got much wiggle room here. What I mean by this is that if I just go and get a random Mun encounter and then I'll just see what kind of orbit I end up in, I'll probably be in a very eccentric orbit that's going to take more Delta V to circularize. And really, I want to be able to set up an ideal, optimal encounter from low curve and all, which I can't do with the current Maneuver No Planner because it's glitched. But I'm going to show you guys how you can do it. I was waiting until the Mun just popped up from behind Kerbin, and then I'm just going to burn prograde. And that will set you up on an optimal MUN trajectory. So getting to the MUN. So with the current maneuver node situation, the MUN is actually not affected because you can get to the MUN like this. And this is how. So we're just going to watch the map screen. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. There, there we are. And we can see our periapsis, 18-ish kilometers, which is great. That's a nice low orbit. Oh, time orbit a bit too fast there. And the burn I performed will have set us up so that we'll be on a more or less equatorial orbit around the MUN without any major inclination, because that's just the sort of orbit you get when you perform MUN encounter burns using the trick that I just used. So there you are. Just bear that tip in mind while we wait for the developers to fix the maneuver planner tool. And oh my gosh, that yellow UI bug is so annoying. Basically, what happened there is that I was performing my capture burn with physical time warp on i then wanted to cut my throttles so that we'd be in a circular orbit but then it says no, you can't do that when time warps active so i had to quickly spam the comma key i ended up pausing the game i had to unpause it and then i could cancel it but not before i'd obviously burned retrograde for too long and I ended up on a uh, crash a collision course now in just a second I'm going to want to try and time warp in the tracking station so I can wait for a point at which the MUN arch that we're aiming for is on the daylight side of the MUN rather than the nighttime side of the MUN so that I can see it more easily, you guys can see it more easily, we all have a fun old time. But that time warp bug is still there, right, where I can't time warp faster than, whatever, 100 times I think because I'm in low MUN orbit. And I want to thank Gregor! For this tip, they commented on my one of my KSP2 videos, and they told me that the tracking station bug is because when you go to the tracking station, it uses the available time warps of your most recent vessel instead of letting you use all of them. If you want to time warp fast, you can switch to a landed vessel and then go back to the tracking station, and then it gives you all the time warps. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm just plopping down any old thing on the runway, and now we can go back to the tracking station and look at that. We could time warp f faster than 100 times, which saves us a lot of time. Now, where is the Mun Arch located, you may be asked? Well, it wasn't actually me that found its location. Uh, I don't know its coordinates or anything, but uh, Reddit user Necro underscore 78 posted a picture on Reddit, on the Kerbal Space Program subreddit, uh, showing the location he'd found it. So, uh, showing the location of where they had found it. So, there is a... The, I'll put a link to the original Reddit post in the description. Uh, the photo they supplied was a screenshot, so it wasn't ideal. So, there's my map is here. Uh, just look for that little crater there, and then it's sort of diagonally up from it. But the Mun Arch is dead easy to spot guys because it's a completely different color to the surrounding land anyway i'm just looking out for it now do you guys see it do you guys see it should be able to see it there uh there we are uh, my my cursor is sort of over that little crater i told you to look out for and we're actually coming up close to it quite quickly so let's switch back to our vessel and uh start and up. Oh, i don't know what happened just there i didn't fire an engine or anything but once again, we're spinning out of control and we're on a collision course with the surface of the mud. So the Kraken has sort of messed with things, uh, messed things up a little bit for me. Now we've got to do a really expensive inclination change to get ourselves on a, you know, a landing path that's going to take us to where the Munarch is located. So that was a bit annoying. And speaking of the Kraken, you may have noticed there's been no engine sounds or anything in this video. Well, there was initially, and then there's been a bit of a period of silence, and that was not by design. Uh, the audio just bugged out, uh, and I did actually figure out how to fix it. I think that's about to happen in a second. I think I'm still just adjusting my uh, landing path, and then here we go. We can deploy the landing legs. Uh, we then started spinning out of control for reasons unknown. Uh, not quite sure what happened there. Try to steady myself by burning the engine to get some uh, thrust vectoring. So that was lots and lots of fun. Anyway, I'm going to fix the audio now. I basically hit escape, go into the settings, go into the audio, change the volume of the master slider, and then immediately put it back to 100. And that fixed the issue. So there you go. If you get the audio bug, that's that's what happens. And then I thought, hey, let's listen to what the landing gear sounds like, because I didn't get a chance to hear it the first time I extended the legs because the audio was bugged out. And that was a mistake. Yep, the, uh, the Kraken, it seems, did not like the fact that I wanted to hear what the landing leg sounded like, and as such, the entire aft section of the ship, including the engine I need to land, was destroyed. Hey, did you see the Mun Arch in the background, though? So I reloaded a quick save, and then this happened. 
So the, the legs were just kept on detaching. I tried all sorts. I tried enabling the cheat that, you know, the unbreakable joints and the no crash damage cheat uh, to no avail. They didn't, they didn't fix the issue. Luckily, the mission isn't completely lost because I have since learned how to access the multiple quick saves. You can just press escape, press load, and then you got all the previous quick saves you previously made. Uh, so I could go back to a previous point in the mission. However, it was quite far back in the mission. It was just after I circularized around the moon, so I needed to once again go back to the Kerbal Space Center, put a flea vehicle on the runway so I could access the faster time warps, time warp to a point where I could see where the Mun Arch was located, perform my deorbit burn and, you know, inclination change to put myself on a landing trajectory, and it was a big, it was a big faff. I've just skipped ahead to the point where I performed the uh, deorbit burn and inclination change. Remember that little crater? We're looking for that's uh, what I'm using as my guide. I know it's sort of it's about 45 degrees up and to the right of where that crater is. My orbital line just crossed over that crater. That's so now you know exactly which one I'm talking about. Probably need to burn a little bit more retrograde in a second, just focusing on the inclination change first. But first, I want to skip ahead to a later point in the mission to show you how my first landing attempt went. Yeah, the Kraken uh, really did not want me to visit this new Monarch, it seems. So I had to reload and then do some of my uh, landing burn again. That's why I didn't show the inclination change just then, because uh, now we've got to do it once more. Uh, but the, the ship kind of is a weird glitch now with visually. It didn't seem to affect performance, but we've got now some, like, things floating around the lander. <laughs> The lander now has its own moon system. Uh, it will be fixed, but I, I will uh, make a quick save and quick load later on. And that gets rid of it. But yeah, the way I fixed it was I made a save and then I just exited to main menu and then came back. So I'm just going to do the rest of my burns and then I'll do a crossfade to the point where I quick load and the, the glitch had to disappear, basically. But you can see I'm sort of like, I very much eyeballed this. There was no real calculations. Uh, here comes the crossfade. Three, two, one. There they go. So yeah, the glitch is now fixed. I decided not to deploy the landing legs, though, until the very last moment that I needed them because I don't know if it's all landing legs in KSP2 or just these ones that are glitched but yeah uh, use these large landing legs with extreme caution uh, would be my advice to you guys anyway I think now's a, oh there's that fun thing again <laughs> uh, now's a good time to start our deorbit burn deorbit burn our landing burn because as you can see the mun arch is in view I'm going to defy my own advice just now actually and deploy the legs early uh, the advice I just gave you about not deploying these landing legs until the very moment that you need them uh, was based on what happens now. Uh, yeah, they just uh, they just pinged open and then we spent it into a spin and I've got any chance of landing now. This thing's got not very good thrust to weight ratio. So I'm crossfading now to uh, the second attempt at landing, this time keeping those legs stowed away. Uh, maybe it's the physics time warp. I don't know and I don't care to keep experimenting to find out Obviously these blending legs have some sort of bug associated with them So I thought, okay now we're about two kilometers off the ground We should probably think about deploying them, but I'm keeping this on uh, Normal real-time no time warp basically and yeah it seems to have deployed okay without any glitches now I'm just trying to touch down in a nice safe speed So it's a bit of a it's quite tricky to land again. It's a very tall lander not great thrust weight ratio, but How's this for a smooth touchdown? Uh, was a bit sketchy. As you can see, it doesn't just plant itself firmly like I hoped it would. Considering how heavy this thing is, you'd think it would sit on the surface quite nicely, but no, it was rocking about really, really sketchily. I right-clicked the landing legs and see if I could change the friction control and the suspension settings, but uh, but I, I couldn't really stop the lander from dancing about like that. Anyway, wanting to waste no time at all, knowing the Kraken did not want me here, so I had to be quick, I decided to deploy the ladders. I just got any old Kerbal out on EVA. Uh, ideally, I would have transferred the Kerbal into the lander module below the command pod, but there was just no time, guys. We have to get my jetpack open. I, I, I ideally wanted the lander to land either on or right next to the Mun Arch, but you guys saw the uh, the uh, the ordeal that was trying to fly this thing, so uh, I decided let's just use the jetpack to get to the Mun Arch. But Kraken didn't like that. Oh, did you see that? <gasps> it's following us. The lander kept teleporting to me, and then it teleported on me and killed me. And I died. So I was like, what? So I don't know what was happening. So I quick loaded and the landing legs fell off. Of course, they fell off. So I thought, to heck with this. I still want to see the mud arch. Uh, Kraken is not going to stop me. Try as the Kraken might. I will not be defeated. 
Buy my Kraken Slayer merchandise, please. My family they are starving, guys. Uh, and as you can see, Kraken is once again trying his best, but I'm trying even harder. You can see the ship keeps on teleporting to me, but we made it. We made it to the Monarch. There it is. <laughs> Honestly, I, I really thought I'd have something interesting to say, but then on my, my mind, it just went blank. But there is the uh, the Kerbal Space Program 1 updated Monarch in Kerbal Space Program 2. As you can see, the whole thing pretty much is fully exposed. It looks absolutely beautiful, and we can, we can confirm that it is indeed a map of the Kerbal system, aka the system that we are in right now. You've got Kerbal, the sun in the middle, Moho, Eve, Juna, Kerbin, I said that in the wrong order, uh, Drez, Jewel, and Elu. There we are. And obviously you've got each planet's respective moons. You've got the five moons of Jewel, the one moon of Juna and Eve, the two moons of Kerbin, and I think that's it, right? <laughs> And while, uh, we, you know, we couldn't land the lander on the top of the arch, we can still land our Kerbal here. What's the Kerbal's name? I didn't see a name anywhere on screen. Am I blind? Oh yeah, Bob Cod Kerman there at the top. Uh, we're gonna la plant a flag. Uh, our, plag our, our flag plan site is just a simple, what is it though? And guys, I can tell you what it is. I have insider knowledge! You know when, um, Nate and Chris said they couldn't tell me about the Monarch and what it meant? Well, they did actually... They slipped me some info that I couldn't reveal until after I visited it in Kerbal Space Room 2 made a video. I could then share this information with you and I'm very, very, oh, I'm very excited. This is really, really exciting because uh, there's been a lot of speculation that this is like some sort of Stargate, right? There are three arches on the Mun. Only one of them is the gate right now and it's the current system. Maybe when, you know... Uh, more star systems are added, each respective monarch will become its own gate and eventually they'll become fast travel points to get around the solar system. Well, right now there are no other solar systems, but this is in fact a gate. Visually it doesn't look like there's much, but if we fly through something very special happens. Here we are, we can use our EVA pack, I've turned off the UI so you guys can get a real good sense of what happens. Here we go. <laughs> Hey, you. You're finally awake. You were trying to cross the border, right? Okay, yeah, so uh, once again, uh, flying through the arch does not, um, does not do anything. I mean, it leads, it leads to the world of Skyrim, it seems. Just like the Mud Arch in KSP1, which is really interesting. Uh, but what can you do? Unfortunately, I've got no spaceship to return to, so I had to... Basically, I loaded the quick save where the legs fell off, because as you can see, the ship spawns in a vertical orientation. So I could quickly fire the engines up and we could take... So basically, we can still sort of return from the mud from this. The Kraken wasn't going to let me win that easy, though. As you can see, the camera is really messing up, like the home key wasn't fixing it, so I did a quick save and a quick load, and that fixed the camera. So now we have a camera focused on our ship and we can get home. So we're going to point ourselves along the 90 degree vector so we have the most efficient descent possible because we've only got about a thousand meters per second of delta V. In that much really to get yeah, to get back into orbit and then get back to Kerbin and the Kraken, the Kraken had one final play. Uh, if we open up the, uh, actually here I'm opening up the resource manager because I'm like oh I'm, I'm not sure if I do have enough delta V. Actually, I wanted to see if any of my tanks aren't draining but alas they all were uh, and then I made the realization of what exactly was happening with the Kraken? Uh, as you can see, I massively overshot with my apoapsis. It's 80 kilometers underneath the nav ball there, which is way too much. I thought, let's just have a look at the map screen, see what it looks like. And uh, yes, I no longer have any orbital information on the map screen. No blue line uh, for the rest of the mission now. So I went back to the quick save I made after just taking off from the Mun. So I'm back to this point. And hopefully the map screen is now fixed. And it is not. It is not fixed. Yes, I have to get back to Kerbin, basically with no map screen. Luckily, the UI of KSP2 is pretty good. We can see our Apogee and Perigee underneath the nav ball, and obviously things like our surface velocity, uh, altitude, stuff like that. So we have all the information we need. It's just not really ideal, and I can't plan any maneuver nodes, or maneuver plans, sorry. So I'm going to have to just guess when the most efficient time to burn is. So, uh... Very excited, and obviously I can't tell 
I won't be able to tell if I've got enough Delta V or not to do the burns and stuff because I can't make maneuver plans because I have no orbital line on which to make them. And I did, I did try to make a maneuver plan. I thought maybe the orbital line is there. It's just invisible or the texture's bugged out. So I tried clicking around my ship and where the orbital line should be to see if I could make a maneuver plan, but I couldn't. So now we're just going to use the information under the nav ball to try and get back. So can't see anything. Yeah, that was probably me just trying to make the maneuver node just there, actually. We are in a stable orbit, you know, 30 kilometers, 20 kilometers. I did another quick save, quick load, see if that fixed it. It hasn't fixed it, so now I'm like, right, we've got 440 meters per second to get back, which I think is enough, but I don't know now, and obviously I can't make maneuver nodes to confirm this. So we're just gonna go ahead and try anyway. The Kraken is not gonna win today. I've got too far. I've been to and from the universe of Skyrim in this mission. So I waited till my ship was just passing over the Mun's forward trajectory. I hope that makes sense. Burning here puts me on an escape trajectory that puts me behind the Mun, which puts me on a lower orbit, which makes it easier to get back to Kerbin. All I did was I just burned until I saw my apoapsis become a negative number. That indicates that we're no longer in the Mun's sphere of influence. There it is there, minus 22 kilometers. So now we're just going to time warp up and uh, now we're around Kerbin. Still got no orbital line. I was hoping maybe a sphere of influence change would fix things, but it didn't. So now I'm just getting to Kerbin apoapsis. We see our periapsis is quite low, so this should be quite a cheap burn. But I'm still a bit nervous. We've only got 240 meters per second of delta V left. I'm just going to do a retrograde burn at our apoapsis and watch our periapsis come down. And there we are. We have a negative number for our periapsis, which means our periapsis it, it doesn't exist. We're just going to enter Kerbin. Bit of a steep re-entry, I know, but luckily there is no thermal in the game or heating in the game at the moment. So uh, we should be safe. I could have... It wasn't decoupling for some reason. Now we're decoupling. And look at this. How's that for skill? We're landing at the Kerbal... Spe I planned this, guys. I planned it. I didn't plan it. It was um, pure luck, really. I don't think that's ever happened to me before. I just, it probably has, statistically speaking, how many KSP videos I've made these days. But, like, you know, it was pretty... pretty I, this is, like, my, what, second ever mission in Kerbal Space Program 2 in, in my house? In fact, no, it's not. I've done a few that didn't really work. So, but I've not done... I've, had the, I've owned the game for, like, two days now. So, you know, it's pretty good going that I've managed to pull off a, a feat of luck this, this soon on in my career. Man, I can't wait for them to fix parachutes so that they actually separate out like they're doing KSP-1. But uh, yeah, here we are just touching down now. Landing in a lovely little meadow, just a stone's throw away from the Kerbal Space Center. And that pretty much concludes this video. We've gone to the new Monarch, now you know how to get there as well. We've seen its secrets and uh, yeah. Thank you for watching this video. If you want to help support this channel, you can join my channel membership scheme or my Patreon program, just like these folk on the left did. And hey, you can buy that. I really like that Cracker's Lair hoodie. It's like one of my favorite hoodie now. Uh, so I'm too scared to wear it. But yeah, uh, and there are links on screen to more videos from my channel that YouTube thinks you'll like. Hopefully they're good picks. Uh, and that concludes the week of KSP2 video madness. I can't keep daily videos up going forward. It's too much. It's too much for me. Probably too much for you guys as well. But I hope you enjoyed the seven-day Kerbal and I'll see you in the next video.